begin by measuring 10 milliliters each of the sodium hydroxide and the crystal violet. Pour each of these into separate small beakers. Then place the beakers into an ice bath. This way they will be very cold when it is time to do our second trial at a lower temperature. You can use a large beaker or share a crystallization dish with another lab partner. After you have set this up, again measure 10 milliliters of each chemical to be used with the room temperature reaction. We will be using Logger Pro and you will be using the colorimeter that goes with Logger Pro. The setting on the colorimeter should be 565 nanometers. These cuvettes are a little different than the cuvettes we've used in other labs. You'll notice first they are square. There is a side that has ribbing on it and a side that is smooth. We want to avoid touching the smooth side because this is the side that light will pass through. Your lab manual refers to a reference mark. Sometimes you will see at the top of one of the edges a triangle. If not, just make sure that you face one of the clear sides towards the reference mark in the calorimeter. When you open Logger Pro, you're going to need to open the appropriate program. Open the folder and look for Chemistry with Vernier. You're going to need to scroll down a bit to find Lab 30. Open the Rate of Crystal Violet and you will see a yellowish background. This means that it is all set up for the lab. We want to make sure everything is set up before we get started because the reaction will begin as soon as we mix the two chemicals. The first thing you need to do is create a blank. This is to show the calorimeter how much light would be absorbed just by the water. We're going to fill our cuvette about three quarters full and we're going to wipe down the sides. We want to make sure there are no fingerprints on the smooth edges. Remember to only handle the cuvette by the ribbed side. We'll then put a lid on the cuvette. We need to open the colorimeter and we'll see inside a square hole where the cuvette will go. Near the top there is a triangle that indicates where the smooth side of the cuvette should be as this is where the light source is coming from. So I'm going to place my blank inside the colorimeter so that Cuvette is between the triangle and the detector on the colorimeter. We'll close the lid. And we want to use the arrow buttons to adjust to 565 nanometers. We'll then hold the cal button until the red light starts to blink. Keep holding until the calibration light stops blinking. This tells you the calibration is complete. The next part we will need to mix our two chemicals together. Because the reaction starts right away, we need to make sure we start the time on the computer. So as soon as we mix the two reagents into a beaker, we're going to go over to the netbook and hit the collect button. This won't actually collect any data, it will simply start the time. Meanwhile, we're going to stir our reaction so that all the reactants are well mixed and we have about three minutes before we need to start the next part. Before we do anything else with the colorimeter, we want to take the temperature. This is because we're going to be doing this reaction at two temperatures. There's not a place to record this on the computer, so you will need to put this in your notebook. We want to fill our cuvette with the crystal violet. Remember that there's water in there and we may dilute it if we just simply put it in there. So what we're going to have to do is do our fill, dump, fill, dump, fill method. Empty the water out, add some of your crystal violet mixture, empty that out, add some more crystal violet mixture, 
empty again, and finally fill to three-fourths full. At this point, you can return the lid and begin with your measurements. Place your cuvette in the colorimeter, close the lid, and click on Keep. This is going to record the absorbance at that particular time. Take note at what the time is, and in about 45 seconds, you're going to take another measurement. Notice that for the time being, the measurement will be about the same on the graph. We can see this square moving slightly horizontally, but not vertically. It won't change vertically until we hit the keep button. Now that it has been 45 seconds since our last measurement, we're going to click keep again. Notice that the square has moved down a considerable amount. Because this auto scales, it's going to look weird for the first couple of measurements, and then it will start to straighten out. Notice that we're using decimals per minute rather than seconds. This means that 45 seconds is about 0.75 minutes. Now that you've collected all of your data, it's time to process your data to determine the rate. So we have the time and the absorbance already on here. We're going to need to have a calculated column for the natural log of the absorbance, which remember is counting for our concentration of CV, and for one over CV, or one over the absorbance. We're gonna look at the data one at a time. Our original data, is just the absorbance or concentration versus time. We're going to analyze the data and see what a linear fit looks like. One thing that you will notice if we move this box out of the way is that on our straight line, the middle part of the line is below our best fit line, whereas the top and bottom are above our best fit line. That's an indication that our line is actually curved rather than linear. We're going to take note of what the slope is, and we're going to take note of, of the correlation. We want that correlation to be very close to 1 or negative 1 because this one has a negative slope. If it is um, very close to negative 1, um, that means that we have a good estimation of the slope. Now I'm going to look at the natural log. So I'm going to select natural log of CV to be my y-axis. So the line has changed just a little bit and again I'm going to see what the linear fit looks like. As I look at this, and pull this box out of the way, I have a pretty nice fit along here. There's a couple of data points in the middle that seem to be off, but they were off in the other graph as well. I'm going to take note of my slope and I'm also going to take note of my correlation. This one is an even better fit, 0.9997. Now I'm going to finally look at my 1 over CV. I'm going to go to the y-axis, select inverse CV. Notice the slope is going upward this time. We expect for that to happen. As we do one over the concentration, we should have an upward or positive slope. Again, I'm going to find the linear fit, and I notice again that I've got the middle part of the graph below my linear fit line and the bottom and the top above my linear fit line. So this is indicating that it's probably curved somewhat. My correlation, 0.996, is not as good as it was for the natural log. So I'm going to use my natural log graph. Use this to interpret what you think the order of the reaction is. Now I'm ready to do my cold temperature reaction. Remember that temperature relates to the reaction rate in that it slows down the molecules, reducing the number of collisions, and making the rate slower. My two, test tube, or my two beakers have been sitting in an ice bath for a long time now as I did my first reaction. I'm going to mix the two together 
and I'm going to start the time on my computer by hitting collect. It will ask me if I want to store the latest run or erase and continue. You may want to store the latest run so you can refer to it later. I need to determine the temperature of this reaction. Leave the thermometer in the beaker for several seconds so that you get a good reading. The temperature will continue to drop and remain steady when it is at the appropriate temperature. This seems to be holding steady at 3.2, so I'm going to record that in my lab manual. I'm going to return the beaker to the ice bath so that it can stay cold while I'm waiting for my, for my process to start. I'm going to stir so that all of the reactants are properly mixed. Before three minutes have passed, be sure that you fill your cuvette three quarters full. This had the other concentration of crystal violet in it before, so I'm going to use the fill, dump, fill, dump, fill method. I'm going to fill to collect all the droplets of the crystal violet and dump that out. Do that twice and then fill it to three quarters full. I want to be sure that the outsides of my cuvette remain clear, so I'm going to take a tissue or a chem wipe to wipe down those smooth sides while trying to hold only the ribbed sides. Then I'm going to replace the lid and keep this cuvette in the ice bath. When you remove the cuvette from the ice bath, it will be wet and may also be somewhat cloudy. Be sure to wipe it off with the chem wipe before you insert it into the calorimeter. It won't be as steady as the last reading as the temperature will be beginning to change. So just hit the keep button after about a second or two and then proceed on as you did with the room temperature measurements. Take out the cuvette in between so the light from the colorimeter doesn't warm it up. For best results, once you have started making your measurements, do not put the cuvette back in the water, but keep it near the ice bath so that the temperature does not rapidly change. I've set up my lab notebook ahead of time and recorded the temperature data as well as the slope and the correlation that I have found for my initial uh, room temperature reading. I also need to record the slope and correlation for my cold temperature reading. On the following pages, I will have to write down the evidence that I have that my reaction should be using this slope and not the other slopes. I will also do calculations correlating the rate constant to the activation energy. We will need to have our temperature in Kelvin, so be sure to convert these. Answer the processing the data questions in your lab notebook. The questions are started here, but they are not completed. So don't just copy down what's written in this notebook. You'll need to answer them yourself. Remember that in order to determine the rate constant k, you will be looking at the slope of the graph that is most nearly linear. Rate law in question three will take this form, but you will need to indicate the order of the reaction with an exponent here. We didn't collect enough data in order to determine the half-life according to the first part of question four. You might be able to consider how we would know that just by looking at the data. Nonetheless, you can answer the question about what the half-life is by using the equation. Repeat the collection of the rate law and the rate constant for the cold temperature data and use it to solve for the activation energy. The equation is shown here with the variables defined. Your R value is the gas constant in terms of joules per mole Kelvin. Remember that this is joules and not kilojoules. You will need to follow up by answering the post-lab questions indicated by your professors. To wrap up, you will receive an Excel file with the data collected. Use your graphing skills to fill in the natural log of the absorbance and one of the absorbance columns. 
Graphs can be found by clicking on the tabs at the bottom of the worksheet. Add linear trend lines for each of these graphs, making note of the slope and the fit in your lab notebook.